Chang and this is the best of Bloomberg Technology, where we bring you all our top interviews from this week in tech. Coming up, what a week it was for big tech earnings. We will break down all the highlights and the lowlights in the next hour. Plus, truly historic. That is how Elon Musk is describing Tesla's third quarter as the company reports its first profit in five years. Can they do it again and again? And Sun steps away. Why the head of SoftBank was a no-show in the desert and what this means for the future of the Vision Fund's ties to Saudi Arabia. But first to our lead. It was a huge week in tech on the earnings front and it all started with a surprise third quarter report on Wednesday from Tesla, along with Microsoft, Alphabet, Twitter and Snap. But we have to kick things off with Amazon out Thursday after the bell. Take a listen. So if you look at the revenue miss, uh, especially on the guidance side of things, it was a big number. The spending part, we were not worried about much because we expected spending pressure across the board. The wage hike uh, issue was uh, one of the uncertainties. Uh, from the business perspective, there are two areas where we see the weakness in terms of expectation. One is Whole Foods, uh, the physical stores. You know, there's a sequential decline and uh, they were lapping a full quarter of Whole Foods acquisition for fourth quarter. So basically that's, that's one area where maybe the physical uh, push is not growing as fast uh, as uh, as we expected and the second area is international growth in general uh, that slowed down materially now they mentioned there was a, a change in the holiday season for uh, India that sort of pushed out some sales but with forex headwinds you know that becomes a worry as well so if you take those two things out of the equation and look at like AWS the advertising division they did they did fine I mean there was some slight uh, uh, growth rate uh, decline uh, in terms of like what they did last couple of quarters but that's just law of large numbers. But based on you know what we are seeing so far, I think these are the two areas where we are worried. We can assume fine is not acceptable for CEO Jeff Bezos. Darren, you know what do you make of this? I, I think we're still seeing really strong growth. I don't I don't think Jeff Bezos has anything to be worried about in areas like private label products, which Amazon is placing a big focus on. We saw that grow 22 percent year over year, and especially in some of those non commodity products, uh, Amazon Basics is their behemoth there that sells cell phone charging and batteries and so forth. We saw 60% year-over-year growth in non-commodity Amazon private label products. We also saw huge growth in, in advertising revenue. I mean, up to 10% of all the product searches on Amazon now come from a sponsored search, and that's up from 3% in January of 2017. So there's huge room for growth. Let's talk about that because Alphabet and Facebook have dominated the digital ad market. Uh, Amazon is a distant third, but could at some point um, catch up. Jachandra, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you'll, you'll hear what uh, Ruth Porat had to say about this in, in the next segment. But, you know, can Amazon really get there? So retail is a big segment for Google. It's the biggest vertical for them and from an advertising perspective. And now we are seeing larger brands warming up to Amazon a lot more given, you know, they've disclosed 100 million plus prime members. So it's too big to ignore. So now what happens is sales shift, the ad dollars shift with it. And Amazon is targeting two buckets, right? One is the uh, search bucket that Google has. The other is the trade promotions bucket. So they do get to sort of like benefit from, from that shift that's happening from bigger brands and they can deliver, show the ROI, because you, you are advertising the product and you know exactly you know how much the sales were and things like that. So the targeting becomes much better. So that becomes an issue. So Google needs to sort of like go in the opposite direction over here. You know, uh, the, we saw, saw their partnerships with commerce, uh, JD.com investment. Uh, and uh, we think like Google should be more aggressive in e-commerce. And of course, take the cloud stance a lot more aggressively when Amazon is encroaching on them uh, from an advertising standpoint. Meantime, we know that costs are going to go up. Amazon is increasing wages across the board. Um, the company is also opening HQ2. They're going to be creating 50,000 new jobs. I mean, how, how are those costs going to impact coming quarters if we're in a state of fine? right now. I, I think they still have a ton of room to, to, to grow and offset those costs. I mean, again, to, to piggyback off of what uh, you were saying, over 50% of the product searches online now occur on Amazon rather than Google. Like the actual e-commerce product searches, which is the stuff that people want to pay for in, in right. sponsored search clicks. So I think as they invest in those kinds of tools and costs go up, they're going to see a much higher spike in the, in the return that they get. Jachandra, talk to us about what's happening globally. I mean, we know that there is a huge turf war happening in India in particular, um, but also other parts of the world. 
Yeah, so, so that's one uncertainty that we are still yet to figure out, and obviously on the call, hopefully we get some guidance on that, is the tariff uncertainty causing some of this guidance uh, to go down, right? Because there's a direct impact from a cross-border trade perspective. It's a smaller portion of the GMV, but there's an indirect impact from margins of third-party sellers and what it means for third-party sales growth and things like that. So we'll hopefully get more details on that, but that's definitely a concern. Uh, the Amazon earnings call scheduled to start about 25 minutes from now. Darren, what do you I want to hear. I want to hear how the investments that they're making in their advertising platform are paying off international growth because I completely agree. I think there's a lot of room. Uh, there's a lot of room for opportunity there. There's also a lot of risk if they don't execute properly. Uh, and I'd love to hear more about how they're uh, interacting with the rest of the ecosystem. I think both retailers uh, and brands are probably very reticent about what's happening right now and very nervous. And I think they really need to figure out how to create a little bit more of an equilibrium like Google has done uh, uh, in, in that market. We've got a holiday season coming up, uh, increased postal rates, uh, sparring with the president. How are the next few weeks? Uh, the next few weeks are critical for Amazon every year, uh, but maybe this year in particular. Yes, especially given the guidance. Now, uh, the street is going to expect more uh, than what they're, what they're guiding, uh, given the holiday season demand, especially with so many more Prime members that they have right now versus what they had last year. I think where it boils down to is, like, are they able to manage the cost in terms of scaling the capacity to deliver these products and, and, and uh, sort of meet those numbers? Because we did see uh, that created an issue back in 4Q15. Uh, and remember, Amazon always like used to talk about profits as profits will ebb and flow. They were flowing, and now the uh, guidance is suggesting there might be some ebb because wage hikes, the postal rates thing you talk about, and uh, basically scaling logistics to uh, support demand. Apple CEO Tim Cook is touting the importance of privacy and legislation to protect it. Speaking at a conference in Brussels this week, Cook slammed tech companies that monetize their business by collecting user data. That means Facebook and Google. Meantime, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg defended his company's ad-based business model and said he's aware Facebook needs to do more to protect user privacy. Coming up, Tesla investors cheered the company's best ever quarter this week with shares of the company rocketing up. But Wall Street isn't ready to drop its cautious stance just yet. Can Elon Musk keep delivering? That is next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Now to Tesla. Shares soared in late trading after the company reported its third quarter results Wednesday. Tesla usually gives about two weeks notice when earnings will drop, but this time the company gave barely two days. And as Elon Musk strongly hinted, Tesla has made money. The company's net income was $312 million when analysts expected a loss. And get this, positive cash flow of $881 million. Tesla made an average of 4,300 Model 3s a week with 455,000 people having expressed interest in the car. Elon Musk can keep selling that production. That's big revenue and real profits. We caught up with Kelly Blue Book executive analyst Akshay Anand and Bloomberg's Dana Hull to break it all down. I think the big thing is that obviously they're profitable, huge. First time they've been profitable since the uh, third quarter of 2016. So they're all, it's only their third quarter profitable quarter ever in the company's you know long history but demand is still really strong I mean that was the big surprise the, the big bear thesis was that they pulled out all the stops in Q3 and that there would be no longer any demand for these cars but the customer deposit number is still like 900 900 million dollars in deposits yeah so demand for these cars is continuing even though they have worked through some of the reservations as more cars get on the road more people are ordering them so Aksha the question is can they do this again and again and again is this going to become routine yeah, I mean, this is, I think, what we're watching for, right? To uh, Dana's point, you know, there was a lot of speculation that some of these numbers might be front-loaded. But, I mean, this was a huge beat, as we all saw. And, you know, Elon said as much that we expect to be profitable going forward from Q3 onwards. So if they can repeat this going forward, this is a huge win for Tesla, and it really shows the power of the brand more than anything. I want to talk a little bit about the timing, Dana, because normally Tesla gives, you know, a significant amount of notice for earnings results. This happened in less than two days on Monday night. We found out that Tesla would be reporting today. The SEC prefers to have more notice. Is there anything 
unusual about that? Yeah, Anything to, to be to be fair to be <laughs> interpret? fair to be fair, Tesla always reports earnings on a Wednesday. Next Wednesday is Halloween. I know that myself and I think some analysts in New York were asking the company, "Can you please not do it on Halloween?" Some of us have kids, so, so we, we were actually expecting that earnings would come maybe next Tuesday or possibly be pushed into November. But clearly, the company has a good story to tell. Might as well tell it early. Uh, you know, the the fact that they pushed pulled the earnings forward, everyone was expecting that this would be good news. Akshay, let's <clears throat> take a deeper dive into the actual numbers. The company said uh, still on target to deliver 100,000 Model S and X cars this year. Of course, uh, we're always looking at the Model 3. You know, when you look at the actual delivery numbers, are you liking what you see? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the big things about the delivery numbers is A, Model 3, Model S, Model X were all strong. And keep in mind, we haven't even seen the base level Model 3 yet, right? So I think that's a key part of what we're looking at is going forward, once the base level Model 3 does come out, a lot of consumers are going to want this car at $35,000 or at the lowest price, right? So there's still plenty of demand for Tesla. And, you know, like I mentioned earlier, it's a brand that has so much power. It's almost like a lifestyle thing with Google or Apple. So as long as consumers are still interested, they're going to do well. Tesla trading at new session highs and after hours trading up 14 percent. Dana, this is after uh, a very tumultuous quarter. Elon Musk's run in with the F uh, SEC after he uh, claimed that he was planning to tech take Tesla private and had the funding secured for it. Tesla and Musk have now been fined collectively 40 million dollars. He is stepping down as chairman. What are the outstanding issues with this settlement? A judge has approved it, but we're still waiting to see who will become Tesla chair, correct? We're, st we're still waiting to see who the new chair will be. We should know that by mid-November. And then the board has to appoint two new independent directors by the end of December. And uh, we don't know who those folks will be either. The, the board has been really mum about the search process. It's not clear if they're leading it internally, if they've contracted with a search firm. But that's going to really change the dynamics of the board. Meantime, they're supposed to be also monitoring his tweets and his communications, correct? Um, that hasn't, that obviously hasn't kicked well, in yet. Well, exactly. <laughs> the, the tweets have continued. And, yeah. and Aksha, you know, I'm curious if, if you remain at all concerned about Elon Musk's other behavior um, and if that is something that you're watching. It is something we're definitely watching, but the reality is I think Tesla has a lot of leeway as a brand when it comes to consumer perceptions, right? Uh, it is always under scrutiny, but I think a lot of consumers do see this as, you know, Elon is different. As long as he doesn't do anything egregious, we can take some of that if they're building these beautiful cars and, and hopefully the quality comes along with it. So I do think the brand has some leeway as far as that is concerned with consumers. Kelly Blue Book's Aksha Anand and Bloomberg's Dana Hall. Well, Tesla also got a boost this week from Andrew Left of Citron Research, one of the company's most outspoken short sellers. On Tuesday, ahead of earnings, Left announced he is now long on the company this quarter, writing in a blog post, like a magic trick while everyone is focused on Elon smoking weed, he is quietly smoking the whole automotive industry. Now remember, earlier this year, Left sued Tesla and Musk for, quote, stock manipulation and predicted shares would slide to $100 by year end. Bloomberg Markets anchors Caroline Hyde and Scarlett Fu caught up with Left and asked, what's changed? It's amazing. Elon Musk has made such a sideshow of himself that people started to forget about, including myself, the underlying business. And all the headlines are about Musk does this, Musk does that. And then you start reading about the car. So once I, I scrape that past, and as a short seller, I'm always rechecking my thesis. And up to a few weeks ago, I was short. And I'm rechecking, and then I'm like, oh my god. This car is just dominating, and the Model S is still dominating. Not just dominating, they're just completely smoking the competition. And then I'm like, well, can they make money? So I started to read more and go more and deeper and deeper. And I realized that for these, all these years, I, I, couldn't really, I didn't really understand the Tesla stories. I'm understanding it more. Now, I'm not this uber Tesla bull, and I know there's still a lot of factors, and execution is still there. Right. But I think being short, going into this quarter, knowing that he just uh, made earnings a week earlier, right on top of Ford's earnings, and knowing that the company's finally hitting stride with production of the Model 3, and I see the short interest, I'm like, oh, no, that's just wrong. Yeah, I'm looking at the short interest, and it is still elevated. So you think the October 24th new date for earnings is a positive sign. I want to know about where we go in terms of capital needs for Tesla, because there's a lot of worries that always they need to raise more money, might have to therefore add supply to the equity out there. You're not worried about that anymore? I mean, we'll know in about, what, like 26 hours, 27 hours? 
uh, see how much if they generate free cash flow. Uh, Musk said, you know, for years I've doubted Musk. I, when I heard the word gigafactory, I laughed. Uh, there's so many different things that Tesla said they, was gonna, they were going to do, and I laughed. Uh, so sure enough, I mean, I think the guy had the quickest settlement ever with the SEC. He actually got the SEC to work on a Saturday. So when he says there's going to be cash flow positive, possibly this quarter, uh, I'm not going to doubt it. I'll wait and see it. So uh, here's the thing. We need to put Tesla in the context of the bigger automotive picture and demand as well. Auto sales as a whole has plateaued. They peaked in September 2017 at an annualized rate of 18.47 million. Would Tesla be subject to the same um, industry headwinds, cyclical headwinds no, as everyone else? No, that's the amazing part about it. That's, that, that's what really surprised me. Not only is Tesla eating from BMW, Mercedes, and Audi, but they're also eating from Toyota and Honda. People are actually paying more money to drive a Tesla. Uh, it's just, it's the, uh, it's a revolution that I actually underestimated the way people are, are buying these cars. So the numbers that you're talking about, 100% true for other automakers, not for Tesla. And it is what it is. Where, therefore, does the price target go for you in terms of you've got out there some, you've run some models. So, so here's, this is where it gets tricky. Because the real question and that I always said as a short seller is at the end of the day, it's a car company. But we're basing those estimates on profits on old school manufacturing. So the more you read, the more you see that, you know, by, by not sourcing as many parts, by not having as many parts, doing away with the dealer networks and unions, where does this model take you? And you don't know. And, you know, Monroe and Associates out of Detroit, uh, one of the leading auto industry experts, said they could do over 30% gross margins on the uh, Model 3. I'm sure they'll do more of those on, the, on a crossover. So we, we don't know. And, and that's where it's, it's become a black box. That was Andrew Left of Citron Research. Still ahead, we stay on earnings and break down the main takeaways from Alphabet out Thursday. And later, Twitter surged the most in eight months this week as sales blew past their forecast. Why advertisers are spending more. This is Bloomberg. Let's get right back to this week's main headline in tech, and that is earnings. We parsed through Alphabet results Thursday after the bell. I also spoke with Alphabet CFO Ruth Porat. Take a listen. I guess what I would start with is, look, I don't think it's a coincidence that you see a lot of these big cap technology and communication services companies missing on the revenue line. And I think a lot of that, frankly, is due uh, to currency, where the dollar strengthened pretty significantly over the course of the quarter. And um, look, I think when you look at the miss, I mean, it was by a hair. And granted, it was a miss, but it was really a very, very small miss. And if you round, like a lot of people do, it really wasn't a miss. So the way we look at it is it was a good quarter. It's amazing to me also how very few people seem to also be focusing on the earnings beat, which was substantial, aided by a lower tax rate, for example. But overall, I think this was a solid quarter, above 20% growth again. And uh, it seems like the trends are intact for the company to be successful for a number of quarters to come. That said, you know, there is uh, concern about Amazon, uh, you know, distantly on Google and Facebook's tail when it comes to digital advertising. I asked Ruth Porat if she thinks of Amazon as a threat. Uh, she said, whenever new inventory is created that attracts consumer interest, advertisers will be interested. From what we're seeing, though, many dollars are coming from trade promotion and other budgets that haven't historically been spent on digital advertising. So we believe this expands the opportunity to tap into uh, digital ad budgets. Bob, do you buy that? Well, sure. I mean, I, I think that makes a lot of sense in terms of, of where they're trying to go, especially with all the things they're doing around YouTube and other content that they're bringing available. You know, the other thing I think, and she mentioned it briefly, is some of their R&D costs were also higher. They've got a lot of investments in hardware. They've got a lot of investments in some of their YouTube services, the YouTube TV, for example. Um, and I think those are interesting opportunities moving forward. At the end of the day, look, it's, it's getting expensive to get to the right people and to get to the, these services out, hence these acquisitions 
acquisition costs are going up, and that is an issue. But, uh, you know, like the other gentleman said, it's, it, it, it's essentially it hit it, but just barely missed. Um, and the opportunities moving forward for them are still very strong. The concern, of course, is the regulatory environment. What's going to happen there? There's a lot of clouds hanging over Google slash Alphabet, and I think those are concerns that people are thinking about, and we have to think about long term. Let's talk about some of those clouds. Uh, privacy, fake news, being called to testify before Congress, not showing up. You know, all of these things uh, are very concerning, and I, I, try, I, I asked her if these privacy concerns were having an impact on users, having an impact on advertising, and, and, and she didn't really answer that question. Um, I also asked about China uh, and, and Google's reported plans to uh, reignite its search engine in China. Uh, she told me at this point, we continue to invest to help and support Chinese users from developing Android through mobile apps like Google Translate. As Sundar has said repeatedly, we are not close to launching a search product in China, and given the sheer scale of the market, we are focused on making sure we are doing the right things for the long term. Scott, what do you make of that? So the way we've thought about this is while it would be great um, in a number of respects, at least from an operational and financial perspective, um, for Google to re-enter China, the reality is, especially given the growing tensions between the two countries and uh, their governments, uh, we see that as a long shot, particularly over the near to intermediate term. It's actually one of the reasons why um, just over the last day or two we upgraded shares uh, of Baidu because we think that has been an overhang uh, for that company and its stock. Um, and we don't think that really is viable at this point for Google to re-enter uh, China. I think they have um, far more priorities elsewhere and uh, I think just the political pressure and complexity and costs and risk of failure um, are so substantial. I think, look, continuing to invest in what's been working and things like Waymo, that's the way that, uh, that Google and Alphabet should be investing right now. Do you think that Google should have uh, not dropped Project Maven and continued its work with the DOD? I did ask um, Ruth Porat about that, and she um, you know, talked about how they believe it's important to continue working with the military and laid out all of the other ways that they are doing so. But when you, when you talk to Amazon, um, Jeff Bezos, and Microsoft Satya Nadella, they're saying, look, our country needs to be defended. So yes, we are going to work with the government and the Department of Defense. Yeah, so my opinion on that is I think that they should have continued to talk with the government about that contract. I mean, you're talking, I think, about a $10 billion opportunity, which would have been uh, tremendous for Google and its cloud business, which they've been investing in, but that would really possibly have been a game changer. And I'm not really clear on exactly what the opposition was in terms of moving forward uh, with that contract. And you point out some very good rationales that other companies have articulated. So no, I think that actually was a mistake to walk away from that contract, uh, particularly at this stage. Bob, you know, Google's also got some uh, business being done in Europe. They are facing that, you know, $5 billion record record fine for, for antitrust in issues. And, and she, uh, for the Android issues, I should yeah. say, um, she talked about how it remains to be seen how that will play out. But how much do you think that's going to hurt them? I don't think it's going to hurt them very much financially, because the truth is there are very few alternatives. And ironically, in some ways, Google could actually make more money, because now the the phone makers are going to have to pay Google for services they essentially gave away because they have to be offered as an alternative. Um, so in a weird way, I think it actually helped them. But long term, the, imp the financial impact, I think, is really small. Um, and, and most of these controversies, I think, in the near term, are not going to have a, a big influence on them. The bigger question are, as GDPR gets enforced, as the US develops whatever equivalent it's going to create, as other countries around the world do this, how does that fundamentally impact the business model of what Google does around customized advertising advertising and personal data tracking. Um, again, none of these things are going to impact right away, but certainly longer term, I think those are issues that have to be addressed. Coming up, Sun says no. Why the SoftBank CEO dropped out of a Saudi conference this week and what it means for the future of their vision funds. That's next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the Best of Bloomer Technology. I'm Emily Chang. 
The killing of journalist Jamal Khashoggi caused plenty of big names to pull out of a Saudi Arabian investment conference this week, and that includes SoftBank CEO Masayoshi Son. The move came after Saudi officials admitted to killing Khashoggi inside their Istanbul consulate. Although Sun met privately with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman in Riyadh Monday, his withdrawal from the conference added to the list of other high-profile exits that included SoftBank COO Marcelo Clare. Remember that Saudi Arabia remains one of the SoftBank Vision Fund's biggest backers. They've already committed $45 billion to the first fund and promised another $45 billion for future funds. Bloomberg Selena Wang talked about this with Ray Wang, founder and principal analyst of Constellation Research, and Bloomberg Tech Sarah McBride, who covers all things venture capital. He essentially dropped out in a much more gentle way compared to some of the other business leaders who left. It was sort of a compromise. He went to Riyadh, essentially met with the Crown Prince and other Saudi officials on the sidelines of the conference, but didn't go to the conference itself. However, a lot of SoftBank execs remain at the conference. Uh, now, Ray, we've seen many top executives opt to stay away from the conference, but have continued business relationships with uh, Saudi Arabia. Do you think that the turn of events could fundamentally change the relationship between foreign businesses and Saudi Arabia, or do you think it will eventually be business as usual? You know, I think the money is too hard for people to turn away. And so I think people were hoping that this would blow over. And when it didn't blow over and the facts got worse, people got scared. A lot of the startups, as you know, have very progressive viewpoint. And to have this type of money taint or impact their perspective of what's going on is a, is a challenge. But the double-edged sword is for Saudi Arabia to move out and to progress. They have to make these types of investments. So I think it's going to be a lot of difficult decisions for a lot of startup entrepreneurs and for a lot of the investors. And Sarah, given the intense pressure and scrutiny, what are the chances that SoftBank will actually go elsewhere hunting for the $45 billion for the next fund? Well, I think it's pretty hard to say at this point. And it'll be interesting to see if an argument gets made, much has happened with China, that SoftBank can perhaps influence Saudi Arabia somehow from within and help it become uh, more progressive in certain ways. So I think a lot of people will be starting to try to tell a different story about Saudi Arabia. And Ray, it's worth mentioning that Saudi Arabia has a very long track record of investing in the technology industry and that it also has a very long record of human rights violations. So is a result of this going to cause entrepreneurs and startups to look more critically at where their money is coming from, especially if it's Saudi Arabia? I think we're going to see a transformation in Saudi Arabia long term. I think this is a lesson learned from MBS as well as for the Saudi government to realize that their actions have a huge impact around the world. And investors are going to take note to see what type of ethical reforms may take place um, in terms of how not only uh, how Saudi's actions affect their investment thesis, but also how those actions affect investors' perceptions about doing business in Saudi Arabia. And Sarah, you've been speaking with venture capitalists and startups. What's the sentiment you're getting from them? Is there any instance of a startup turning away money from SoftBank? I've heard there's actually a startup that's currently weighing a term sheet from SoftBank. And because of these allegations, a term sheet that they probably would have accepted uh, without too much thought, they're really wondering whether to take the money or not. And I think more broadly, startups are going to start asking more questions about the investors that their own venture capital investors have. And that really hasn't been the case previously. And Ray, we're seeing tech employees have a lot more influence over their employers. Just one example is the Google protests that caused Google to not renew a defense contract. So do you think that we might see a some sort of revolt within companies that choose to take money from certain sources that are deemed unethical? We definitely see that. We're here in Half Moon Bay at a conference, and, and literally the conversa top conversation was, do we accept money from countries that might not have the same values or same views on human rights or ethics? Uh, and that was a big discussion today, really, about how, what happens. And I think you'll see that. And I think you know you're, there are a couple companies actually are in play with SoftBank as well, as Tara was saying. Um, they are seriously evaluating the term sheets. They're wondering if they can take that money. They're wondering if they can put some conditions on behavior as to what to do with that money. So I, I think we're going to see that. And, and the other piece we may see, too, is with SoftBank, whether they use the last piece of that vision fund, there's about 10 to 15 billion in that, that they might just actually 
um, say, hey, that's a, you know, that's just an excess expense, and and not recognize that revenue for that fund. So we may see some actions like that to soften the blow. That was Ray Wang of Constellation Research and Bloomberg Sarah McBride. Coming up, Twitter surges. The social media platform brings in a strong third quarter. How it's doing that? While well, fewer people are using the platform. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Searched the most in eight months following its third quarter results as sales blew past forecasts. Despite the strong financial numbers, however, monthly average users decreased by 9 million from the second quarter. That means the social network now averages 326 million MAUs. This comes as Twitter continues to purge fake accounts from its platform. We sat down with CFO Ned Siegel Thursday to talk about the third quarter results. We're challenging a ton more than we used to. So that 9 million number is something Jack talked about in front of Congress uh, back in September. Uh, we have become more sophisticated in our understanding of how people create spamming suspicious accounts so that we can detect and prevent their creation or stop them after they've been created. Uh, how many get through really depends on how many of them should get through. We test far more accounts than um, are spamming suspicious and that helps us understand the behavior because just because an account is created on a web browser in a certain country with a certain IP address doesn't necessarily mean that it shouldn't be on the platform the way that another one might. So there's a lot that goes into it. Now as a result of this, you've said monthly active users will continue to decline. How much further will they decline? So we said that MAU would decline in the mid single digit millions in the fourth quarter because of GDPR, our ongoing health work and decisions we might make around SMS contracts that we have with carriers. Um, we don't forecast MAU when we go out further than a quarter. We've done it each of the last two quarters because we could see a decline coming and we wanted to share it with people. When we step back and think about our health work more broadly, we don't want to be constrained by the disclosed metrics. We want to prioritize health above all else because we know that it's a critical growth factor for the company to make sure that Twitter is a safe place for you and me and for the people who should be on the platform and that we're moving spamming and suspicious behavior whenever we can. Sometimes it affects the disclosed metrics. Other times, such as in the second quarter when we removed tens of millions account of accounts and they were largely inactive, it doesn't affect the disclosed metrics as much. So let's talk about the health. Um, you know, yesterday we saw tweets promoting fake bomb scare, fake bombs, hashtags filled with conspiracy theories. How is this still happening? Well, we still have work to do to improve the health of the conversation on Twitter. Uh, there are so many ways for us to address these challenges as people get more sophisticated in how they create uh, the bad behavior on Twitter. Uh, we, uh, one of the great things about Twitter that we're able to benefit from is because it is public and open and real time, uh, we often find things, but often things are corrected by the platform itself, by other people on Twitter who say, that's not true. Or you may believe that, but I believe something different and I want to tell you what I believe. The fact that the platform's open really makes it different and, is, and allows us to take a different approach around policies and enforcement than others are than others may. We are in a period of extremely divisive politics. Just this morning, the president tweeted, a very big part of the anger we see today in our society is caused by the purposely false and inaccurate reporting of the mainstream media that I refer to as fake news. It has gotten so bad and hateful that it is beyond description. Mainstream media must clean up its act fast. You know, I know uh, in the past you've said the president is a newsmaker, he's an influential person, and yet I wonder, is the president getting a pass from Twitter when it comes to what is true and what is false, what is hateful and what is not, what incites violence and what does not, because he is the president? So I'll just go back to what I mentioned before about Twitter being public and open and real time. Those are things that allow people to see what a, a public figure is going to say, regardless of their 
party affiliation, regardless of where they are in the world. They can learn from it, they can respond to it, they can observe how others might respond to it, and we believe that that allows for a healthy public conversation that allows people to have more information than they otherwise might, uh, whether it's something here in the United States or it's around the Brazilian or Mexican elections which were just completed. Uh, it's an important part of our purpose is to serve a public conversation, which means for people to be able to see what other people are saying. Twitter has been very clear about the need to do more. Jack Dorsey has been clear about this. How many more people are you, are you hiring? How many more people are you dedicating to this particular problem? Health is our number one priority. We think about health, growing audience, improving our revenue products and sales as our biggest priorities. I don't expect those to change much as we move into next year. And I think because Twitter is public, open, and real time in nature, we're able to leverage those characteristics and still accomplish a lot through our Twitter services team, through the machine learning uh, that we use to uh, amplify our policies and the Twitter services team. Are you actually gonna add more people? Well, we've been adding more people. So we, we're gonna grow headcount about 15% this year as we continue to invest against all of our priorities and I would expect us to continue to grow headcount but it's not against any one priority it's against all of those priorities to uh, really be able to grow the business and execute against the opportunities that we see. Twitter CFO Ned Siegel there joining us now to discuss eMarketer Principal Analyst Deborah Aho Williamson and Bloomberg Tech's own Selena Wang. Deborah, I'll start with you. So, you know, what do you make of these numbers? You know, advertisers are obviously coming back, spending more, but monthly active users keep going down. And, and, and in some ways, it can be difficult to see the progress, even though Twitter says we are challenging millions of accounts every week. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, Ned Siegel just talked a lot about health. And my viewpoint is, is that if you're gonna get healthy, you're gonna to need to lose some weight. And in the case of Twitter, losing the weight is in losing a few uh, million users. And overall, I think that is a positive step. I think Twitter's focus on the daily active user number is something that's important and needs to be done. And I think that the steps that Twitter's taken to uh, make its ad products better, to uh, reprove itself to advertisers, are starting to pay off. So uh, once this weight loss has gotten done, hopefully we'll see users uh, rejuvenate again, and then we'll see advertisers come right along. Selena, Twitter doesn't report daily active users um, and you know you start you do wonder why absolutely the fact that they don't report it means that there's something they're not quite comfortable with now Ned Siegel did repeat a few times on the conference call that the DAU is well below half of what the MAU is so there's a lot of room for growth something that was a little bit concerning in this quarter is that DAU actually went single digits for the first time in several consecutive quarters of double digit growth so that means that their healthy cleanup efforts the reduction of spam is actually hitting their daily active users and that's the number that really matters that's the number that really matters to advertisers and is showing true engagement. So at some point, they need to, they need to show that these cleanup efforts are not just going to be able to let them monetize better, but are actually going to draw more users to the platform. Right, and that's the question is whether they will, right? I mean, <coughs> certainly, Deborah, the, the cleanup efforts are incredibly important. Tr Twitter, it, and what's happening on Twitter, is driving the national and international conversation. But, you know, once Twitter gets its act together, are they actually going to add a significant number of, of, of new users or is this the size of Twitter? Some 300 million users, is this it? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say whether this is it or not, but I think what we're seeing now though is Twitter finally coming to terms with what it really is. Um, it's not a social network that's going to be the size of Instagram or Facebook. It's a platform for real-time news and engagement. And to the extent that it can continue to promote that, that uniqueness uh, from the other social platforms, I think that will draw users back. I think that, uh, that this constant uh, back and forth of how many people does Twitter have, uh, they just need to embrace what they are. And if it's 300 million, if it's 400 million, whatever it ends up being, if Twitter embraces what it is, then advertisers are going to embrace that as well. I do want to talk about Snap. Uh, Snap reported its third quarter numbers Thursday and all eyes were on user growth. The social media company reporting that the number of daily users fell for a second consecutive quarter to 186 million, almost exactly in line with analyst estimates. The company forecast this trend will continue into the current quarter and gave a weaker than expected revenue forecast of $355 million. This coming as Snap struggles to fend off 
Facebook's Instagram, whose story feature has become the preferred app for millennials, according to a recent study by Piper Jaffrey. Debra, can Snap reverse the trend? <laughs> yep, that's a big question. And you know, the, honestly, the uh, both Snapchat and Twitter are in a similar position in many ways. Uh, they both saw, seen user declines this quarter. However, uh, better than expected revenue. So that's a positive thing. Um, again, I think similar to Twitter, we've got a situation with Snapchat where uh, it's daily active users. Um, and in the case of Twitter, it was monthly active users. But in the case of Snapchat, daily active users have declined uh, yet again for another quarter. Uh, this is definitely concerning to advertisers. Uh, and uh, the fact that Snapchat has been able to monetize those users to a better than expected extent is good, um, but that's probably not going to continue forever. I think that we're going to have to see Snapchat do more to uh, restart that user growth. And how, honestly, how one of those things Snap could be the, the Android app. Yeah, uh, one of those things could be finally figuring out Android. Uh, the Android app has been a thorn in Snapchat side for a long time now. Uh, I think once Snapchat figures that out and relaunches a solid, well-performing Android Android app, they're going to get uh, naturally more users who use Android phones, especially in markets outside of the United States where Android is really popular. So hopefully they'll figure that out. Uh, remains to be seen how quickly, but hopefully they'll figure it out. That was eMarketers Deborah Aho Williamson and Bloomberg's Selena Wang. Still ahead, women in the workplace. A new report shows women continue to be underrepresented at every level. Why the movement seems to be stagnating ahead. This is Bloomberg. SpaceX is looking to Goldman Sachs for some help. Elon Musk's space travel company is seeking a half billion dollar leveraged loan. Goldman is said to be leading the talks with potential investors this week, according to Bloomberg sources. SpaceX's valuation has climbed to about $28 billion as it has routinely launched and landed rockets for reuse, significantly reducing the cost of space travel. This means that it is the third most valuable venture-backed startup in the United States after Uber and Airbnb. Well, year after year, companies continue to declare that they are committed to gender diversity. But according to a new study from Lenin and McKinsey, progress isn't just slow, it's stalled. Compiling data from over 462 companies with some 20 million employees, the 2018 Women in the Workplace report shows that women continue to be underrepresented at every level. While more and more women are doing their part, earning bachelor's degrees, asking for promotions, and staying longer in the workforce, only one in five senior leaders is a woman and one in 25 is a woman of color. We discussed this with Lean In President Rachel Thomas and McKinsey's Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, Lorena Yee. Women are leaning in and companies need to lean in now too. So women have been getting college degrees at higher rates than men for years. Women are asking for more, they're asking for promotions, they're asking for raises as often as men, and they're not leaving the workplace. So companies need to do more. And the biggest thing is they need to treat diversity like the business priority it is. So what do you do when you want to hit a business goal? You have a compelling case, you set goals, you track progress, you report on your progress, and you hold leaders accountable. And too few companies are doing all of those things. So Lorena, you've been working on this report since 2012. Mm -hmm. You know, what is different about this year? Is the difference that there is no difference? So the we see that companies are stalled. That is in and of itself is finding. But what we find is that we're getting closer to understanding some of the root causes. So what companies are saying is we understand that we have a mega problem here. But help us start to break down problems that we can solve in units of one or two years. This will take five, ten years to actually shift a whole generation. So an example of that is tell us about the onlys. Tell us about microaggression. And also tell us whether targets work and how other companies do it. Just as a couple of examples. So you're singling out this idea of the only this year, which is about, you know, the only woman in the room and the experiences that that woman has as a result of being the only woman in the room. You know, talk to us about why that's so, it's so important to understand that experience. Women who are onlys are having a markedly different experience than women who work with other women. They're more likely to face those everyday slights that we've all experienced, since this is a table of women where you're mistaken for someone more junior, you're spoken over in a meeting, you have to prove your capabilities over and over again, and that wears women who are onlys down. We know they feel under pressure, we know they feel isolated, 
and on guard. And it's hard to imagine women can be their best selves and do their best work if they feel that way in the workplace. So Square, for example, when it comes to hiring women engineers, one of the things that they do is they put women on a team with other women, which means they have a lot of teams that are only men because you know men still dominate the workforce. But the idea is that by being on a team with other women, they'll have that sort of camaraderie and that networking and that their experience will be better. But it comes at a cost. Is that something that you would recommend? Um, I actually think it's a really good strategy. In a, in a world where you don't have enough women, how do you make and retain and advance the ones you have? And putting them together creates a different culture for that sub-team. And it starts to tip it. They have role models, they have their own peer network, and they start to advance. Ultimately, what we know about onlys is that if you're the only one over a long period of time, as Rachel was saying, as you're pointing out, you start to feel less motivated to stay at that company, less satisfied, more interested in leaving. If you leave, that's less helpful. But there's a compromise, right, Rachel? I mean, you are having teams of all men making decisions about other things without women on those teams. Yeah, let's be clear. I don't think this is a, a <laughs> simple choice. But this one and done approach of just I've got a single woman on a team or two women on a team so now I have diversity has to change. So until we get where we really need to go, which is we have more women at every level, so we're not picking and choosing where to put our underrepresented women across our teams, a good strategy is to group women together and put them into cohorts and, get ex and accept or realize that that leads to better diversity of ideas on that team and hopefully better performance on that team. So then you can point out and say, look at our blended teams with a good percentage of women and look at the performance they're getting. And building on that, I mean, the challenge is for companies, it's not a one-shot deal. Um, you can fix onlys, but if that's the only thing you do, you probably won't have a lot of success. And so the really hard thing for management teams is you need to do five, six, seven things in concert and you need to stick with it. If this is a seasonal initiative, I guarantee you, you won't be any better than where you were last season. What's the experience for women of color so that the, you're finding? So the experience for women of color, we saw this last year as well, it's worse. They face more barriers to advancement. They get less support from managers. They get less access to senior leaders. And of course, senior leaders are the people that open doors and get you noticed. And they are promoted more slowly. So how do we make sure this isn't just solving for a white woman's problem, right? Because all the talk is about gender, not as much about race. So our report focuses heavily on women of color. And this year, we're looking at lesbian women as well, because they are having a worse experience in the workplace. And we couldn't agree with you more. Elevating women and advancing women means all women. And actually, the women who need the most support in the workplace, based on all the research that we've done, is black women and making sure their voices are heard. Now, Lorena, you are not only the chief inclusion and diversity officer at McKinsey, you also are the leader of tech hardware and services. So this is a notoriously male-dominated industry, which we cover every day. That must be an interesting juxtaposition for you. Sure. So, I mean, it's a couple of different hits. One, for anyone in technical fields, for women in technical fields like engineering, it's harder. Being a person of color is harder. And also, it's probably worth noting, for men of color, it's not an easy road as well, or for anyone who's gay. Um, but one of the things that's interesting is, in the tech field, if I were to put a slight silver lining on it, there is an ethos of transparency, even radical transparency. And you also have people who grow up in an engineering environment where they understand data. So I do think, on a level of hope, one of the things the report does, and I think one of the things is much more common, is to put it all out there. So as an example, there was one company where men felt that gender policies and initiatives were going to hurt them. And they were like 30% off the benchmark of how everyone else felt. And the CEO basically said, let's have a town hall meeting. Let's put it all out there and say, here's what you guys said. Let's explore that. Now, that's not going to fix the tech culture in one go. But I do think the emphasis on data and transparency is something that we can benefit from. That was Lean-In President Rachel Thomas and McKinsey Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer Lorena Yee. That does it for this edition of the Best of Bloomberg Technology. We will bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week. You can tune in every day, 5 p.m. in New York and 2 p.m. in San Francisco. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.